Uh, greetings, everybody. Uh, the title for the talk that I've uh, contrived for the evening was originally called Reconnecting Both Hemispheres of the Brain. Uh, it's going to be talking a lot about some really sciencey sort of stuff, but as, as I keep working on it, it uh, evolves and progresses, and as it turns out, it seems to be exactly on the topic that Matt and Ben had previously presented this evening about um, different techniques for personal development and uh, connection with uh, the world around us through different means, whether it be through mythology or technology. Uh, the, the big point of, or the, the, the one thing that brought everything together for me in this talk was how my connection with this community of people that we're all a part of here, um, how it has really affected my life over the past three months since I did uh, since I did a presentation here at the February Convergence. So, critical thinking. This is the, uh, the, the topic of uh, my previous presentation uh, in February. And uh, these are just some diagrams that kind of sum up uh, the approach that I was taking and the, the, the way that I was going about these things. We have, uh, and start out over here, this is uh, all of life summed up in a Pythagorean triangle, and then you have trivium, which is how mind works, and then uh, conversations, structure of arguments, different ways of thinking. It, it was all very analytical. It was all very, it was all very upfront and, and, and processing and, and trying, trying to get to the, the root of things and using language and, and all that sort of stuff. But what it, what it really came down to and my intention behind making this sort of presentation was, um, was to participate in growing community, and that's what has happened since. And uh, these are the four pictures in Facebook that I'm tagged in since I created a Facebook profile since doing that presentation to connect with all these awesome people. Uh, friends down at the area building the, the permaculture Mandela Garden. We have a group hug here at a previous convergence uh, after a friend of mine, Paula, did a presentation about uh, the art of embrace. Um, here we have, uh, it was, this is at Paula's house, it was a Mayan fire ceremony, which yeah. was just was totally profound and amazing to me. Like, it was just, just so amazing, just what everybody had to share. And over here, this is uh, at uh, Eden's Cove, I think it was on Matt's birthday, and we, we all uh, did a uh, breathing and, and energy sharing exercise, and sharing, bringing energy down, sharing through all sorts of stuff. He would be able to explain a lot better. But it was a really, really amazing sort of experience for me. And, uh, and this, this basically sums up what my intention was from doing my presentation on critical thinking. But what it, what it really comes down to is that, oh wait, uh, okay, I'll, 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 okay. this just explains me a little better. I like creative controversy. I like exploring ideas that, that people don't generally look at, things that are not popular, things that are disregarded or like uncool or, or however, you, however you like to, Really to understand that. Now, I'm very interested in all sorts of fringe topics and alternative perspectives. Anybody who know, knows me will attest to that. Um, so I like to challenge the parameters of dialogic persuasion. And uh, to me, dialogic persuasion means succinctly to, uh, to be willing to change your perspective uh, in a conversation. So I'm able to set my beliefs at the door and uh, engage in, in, a, in a cooperative enterprise with somebody else who has also done the same. That's, that's what I mean by dialogic persuasion. And part of that also means to risk being wrong. It means to say, through my experience of living this life, this is what I, this is what I feel is the best way to express my honest experience. And if somebody uh, has something better or, or has, a, has a perspective on, on a matter that ex explains things more succinctly, more fully, please tell me. I want to know. Like, I'm, I'm here to learn. That's what, that's what this life is about to me. So in, in doing this process, um, I have applied this symbol here called the trivium, which is a systematic methodology for encountering mind. I'll be, I'll be getting into that a little bit further. Um, the, the big reason that I do this and the reason that, uh, that I risk being wrong and, and communicating my direct experience of life honestly is that there, I'm, I'm pretty sure we can all agree on this, there, there's, there's lots of shit wrong in this world and uh, it's no measure of health to be well adjusted to a sick society. Uh, we, we can't go on uh, 
do, doing what we do the way we do it. Uh, a, lot, a lot of people want to talk about things like sustainability, and I think that that's all fine and good on an individual, personal, community sort of level. But when you get onto uh, ask, or when you get onto scales like the United Nations uh, telling people how to go about living their lives sustainably, um, then then I think we got we got problems. <laughs> um, what what it comes down to, and basically what things like. United Nations and academic structures and scientific establishments and even organized religion, they basically just rely on analysis. And in my experience, especially over the past few months, analysis falls short. We cannot uh, give ourselves as full a possible perspective on the human condition strictly by analysis alone. It is simply insufficient. Uh, that quote is not showing up very well, so I will read it. So I've got it on paper. Okay, this quote is coming from um, an amazing natural scientist named Wilhelm Reich. If you're not familiar with Wilhelm Reich, I would recommend his work to anyone. But uh, this short, succinct quote goes, Truth is full, immediate contact between the living that perceives and life that is perceived. The truthful experience is the fuller, the better the contact. Truth is the more comprehensive, the better coordinated are the functions of living perception. It is, within the framework of the totality of natural functioning, an integral part of the organism. And it depends on the integrity as well as integration of all the senses. Although the one thing, well, it's in italics, but you can't see it, but <laughs> all the senses is the part that I, that I really want to highlight by that quote there. So um, basically, the, the way that our social situation is arranged these days is that we are a species with amnesia. We, we don't have access to our origins. We don't know where we came from. We don't have any clue as to where we're going and we haven't decided as to how to go about it. I mean, there are things like, what language were we speaking, say, 7,000 years ago? Nobody here really knows. I mean, people want to uh, provide their conjecture as to how the pyramids were built but nobody really knows. We don't know how these people did these things. There are so many uh, miscellaneous anomalies in the experience of the human condition that it behooves us not to claim truth without our, sorry, it behooves us not to claim truth by strictly analytic methods alone. There are much more, uh, there, there are other important things going on. Like the sensations of living, that was the, the uh, the formatting is messed up in each of these slides, so I will read what is not to be seen. <laughs> the sensations of living. So we have many fundamental aspects of our human experience that are generally disregarded, marginalized, or ridiculed. These senses include, but are not limited to, music, rhythm, language, spatial perception, intuition, common, uh, um, and I put a question mark after common, common sense, because it's generally all too uncommon, um, followed by imagination, artistic creativity, invention, dreaming, emotion, the gut, and energy, just to, to provide a few. So um, each, each of these senses are uh, pretty much as good as infinite in terms of their applicability into the direct living sensation of human life. And, but when approached from an analytical perspective, they all fall short. You get to music and you're like, oh, okay, well, what we have with music, it's strictly harmony, rhythm, melody, and whatever, or, or country, rock, and blues. You know, people, people will always try and provide limited categories as to what each of these different senses might be without actually engaging the, the infinite scope of what these senses can be. And even uh, uh, ben, ben just brought up another sense that is available to us. The EMF, why not attach some magnets to your fingers and have an entirely different perception of the reality around you? Uh, I, have, I have no direct connection to that, so I couldn't really say it. But uh, a, a quote that's on the, on the bottom of the page here that I really like is uh, by an existentialist psychologist, kind of yeah. He says, uh, can you see the one essential way in which science and intuition contrast with each other? True intuition can reach to truth in a flash. Whereas science, whereas in science the whole truth is never reached. So through through all these senses that I listed here, uh, we can basically have a direct, immediate sensation of what truth in life has to offer. And then you go and you start piecing it out with the, the analytical, you know, linguistic, and socially prescribed norms. Uh, 
they will generally fall short, at least in my experience. So, by that, uh, on that note of falling short, I really like this next quote from Buckminster Fuller. That universe tolerates our protracted nonsense suggests significant possibilities. <laughs> so, like we've made it this far with a whole bunch of stupidity. Why don't we? Why don't we just get get things a little more refined, a little more precise on our own, and see how it works out when we work together? So the inner journey here. Uh, I'm going back to the uh, this uh, the symbol called the trivium that I mentioned earlier, and generally the trivium is regarded as uh, as a tool for exploring the external reality. People generally apply it to uh, to very uh, material sort of conditions. Um, I'll, I'm going to go back. I'll explain the trivium a little bit here. Okay, so the trivium is a, it's a systematic process. Um, so you have to start here with grammar. And don't think that grammar means properties of words. What grammar here means is the direct sense experience data of immediate reality. So questions like who, what, where, and when falls into the category of grammar. So it's it's the meat and potatoes of life is in grammar. And ne the next step is logic, but in order to get to logic, you have to follow this space, which says non est in Latin meaning is not. So grammar is not logic, but they're part, of, they're part of the same system. So if you take your first step grammar, which is not logic, but it is your second step, logic is the processing of all of the bits of grammar, which is sense data. So logic asks the question of why. Why do these particular bits of grammar fit together uh, to make up this experience we call reality? Following a similar, uh, similar train down this way, the next step is rhetoric. Rhetoric is not logic, but it is the next step. And rhetoric means how you communicate the logic of processing the grammar to yourself first, and then to other people. So this is, it's a self-reflective process that that uh, basically begins with the advent of awareness whatsoever. Um, this, this stuff was originally taught, um, it's, nobody really knows how far it goes back, but the earliest uh, recorded documents that ascribe to Trivium are in the, uh, in the medieval ages at the precursor to what became universities. They, they were monks sharing with each other this, this teaching that basically describes the process of mind in the world. So mind in the world finds the sense data bits, it processes them, and then it communicates them. What I'm getting at here is that the trivium can be explored, applied to the exploration of our inner journey as well as the analysis of external reality. Known as a dogma for strictly analytical use, but a concise methodological process to aid in the development of self. This process I call emotion, and it is the nexus of human experience. So, Going back here to these other senses uh, that we can't see all of, uh, but we can apply the trivium to all of these senses just like we apply the trivium to emotion. For example, trivium applied to music. We could say, what is the grammar of what we have available to us? Well, okay, well I have this guitar, it has these strings that are, um, that are, uh, what's, what's the word? That are, that are tuned to a particular harmonic resonance that will produce these scales, that produce these notes that I can configure into a pattern that is understood as an emotionally rendering composition to, to the audience. We can apply the trivium to language. Oh, well, these, these were more difficult for me to describe. Trivium applied to spatial perception is pretty easy. Um, just say, like giving directions. Some people are better at giving directions than others. Some people can just visualize. Well, I know that I know my north, south, east, west. I know the blocks. I know the landmarks. I can describe to anybody where to go in the city. And then the logic is how to piece out the case. This person, are they walking? Are they driving? Do they have a helicopter, a motorcycle, a rocket pack? Who knows? We can, we can devise all this through our logic to put together the pieces of grammar to communicate to them exactly how to get from point A to point B. So this trivium applied to a sense of direction might facilitate a more fluid and coherent experience of life for somebody else. Part of the sensation of living. Um, <coughs> I'm missing something here, I gotta say it for you. The next one. Oh, right, 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 right. Okay, so um, in, in the process of emotion, applying the trivium 
uh, I've basically been able to figure that I can apply the trivium to my external experience of reality as well as my internal experience of reality. I got this really awesome quote from Alistair Crowley here. It says, Magic is the science of understanding oneself and one's condition. It is the art of applying that understanding in action. So having the inner and the outer and being able to process all that sort of stuff, we're, we're able to set up these functional dualities. Now these, are, these, thing, these aren't things that are like in, in any sort of uh, absolutist sort of measure, like real or unreal. We're, we're, we're establishing uh, a fictional contrast as a spectrum of interpretation. Okay, so, oh, this one showed up just fine. Functional dualities. Now that we've established functional duality of inner and outer space and have the tool of trivium to guide our emotional adventure, let's explore some more. Okay, we have inner on one side, outer on the other. We have self here, we have other there. We have ego here, we have self there. So you see here, even the word self is not mutually exclusive. To It, it can be used in all sorts of different ways. It can be uh, contrived in different contrasts in order for us to have a tool for exploring ourselves. So we have our left brain, right brain. We have intuitive as knowing, create light shadow, straight curve, analytical, sensing, male, female, sacred, profane. Now, I just wanted to point out here in, in uh, making the juxtaposition of these two, these categories do not necessarily reflect any sort of absolutist sort of duality. And we could say male penis, female vagina, but the, the, the category doesn't really fit. People's uh, experience of life as male or female fit a very wide and vast spectrum of potential potentialities of all sorts. I mean, well, well people, people change from one to the other, right? <laughs> but, uh, that's enough of you. Sacred, profane, uh, entropic, and syntropic. This, this might be a, a little bit uh, more obtuse term for people, but entropy is basically the breaking down of energetic states is moving into constant or sorry, sorry, greater states of disorder, where syntropic and, or negentropic is moving into states of higher order. So entropy, death, syntropy, life. Culture, community, artificial, natural. Tonal, not well, if you're familiar with Carlos Castaneda, that's great. Um, th this one here I, I, is really important to me. Harmonic inclusivity and harmonic in exclusivity. So, Looking at nature, there are certain patterns that happen, whether we analyze it from a biological perspective or a mathematical perspective, we can find that we have transcendental numbers like pi and phi, or phi, or whatever you want to call it. Um, these patterns that occur in nature, they happen in all sorts of different ways. Basically, what I'm trying to get at is that we can either Uh, tune ourselves into the harmonies that are already happening, which is to be inclusive, or we can set ourselves apart from the harmonies that are already happening, which is exclusive, positive, negative. These are just functional dualities. We call them fictional even because they're, they're thought experiments for uh, this conversation. Oh yeah, I meant to say about sacred and profane also, um, is that to me, uh, sacred doesn't mean anything like divine, and profane doesn't mean anything like evil, but sacred means fixed, and profane means random. Because we have sacred geometry, for example, fixed proportions, the harmonic inclusivity that I was talking about a second ago, that's sacred. I mean, these, these are things that cannot be changed by, by whatever means we will to change them. Uh, but profane, the randomness, the, the opportunity to have free will within this pattern that is already fixed for us to experience, but we, we still have the capacity to act profanely, <laughs> or what have you. <laughs> okay, so now that we have all of these dualities set up, <coughs> gets me to the next point, and this is the title of the no effects track, it's just, it's fun. There's, there's no fun in fundamentalism. <laughs> so unfortunately, in examining these these contrasts, these dualisms, uh, that it's it's easy enough for us to uh, to contrast and, and consider one or the other or both or neither. It's easy enough for us to do it, but unfortunately, there occurs too often extreme polarities, and these are fueled heavily by emotional investment over anything else. 
most people think that they're actually they're defending a point, whether it be science or religion or or statecraft or what have you. But but basically, they're uh, they're they're getting into uh, what what Matt was getting into earlier of the of the the mythological story that they've written for themselves and just not not able to get beyond their emotional investment in that mythological tradition. Um, and that's that's what I mean here by bonne conscience. It's just a popular term used by philosophers that means a good conscience. When it's translated into English, it's generally called bad faith. But they mean one and the same thing. A good conscience is like, well, I don't need to worry about that. I mean, um, I, I'm a totally random occurrence, and I'm just going to die and be returned to the dirt and inert, neutral, inorganic matter particles. Anyways, so it doesn't matter what I do in this life. I can go murder, rape, pillage, and plunder all I like. That's that's my idea. That's what I coin as bonne conscience uh, or good consciousness. Uh, but when it comes to bad faith, it's more of a, it's more of a, an internalized sort of process where people are like, well. I don't really like that. It might, it might be true or whatever, but I don't really like it. I'm going to change my behaviors so that it doesn't become a part of my experience. Um, uh, John Paul Sartre is the first author that I've read who used bad faith, and one of the examples that he uses is somebody who is uh, lo looking into a shop window, admiring merchandise or whatever, and out of the reflection sees somebody walking down the street that they don't want to talk to. So that therefore, just you know, turn a little bit so that they have plausible deniability that, oh, I didn't see you, I don't want to talk to you. But it, it, it just comes from denying the direct experience of life, like not, not standing up, not being responsible, and taking accountability for what, what's in front of you. Um, so this happy consciousness, or good consciousness, and bad faith, I think can both be summed up uh, by the term monoculture or, or monologic, basically taking one way of looking at things and running with it, saying like, no matter what, I'm committed to this one way of looking at things, whether it be a particular uh, scientific paradigm, whether it be a particular organized religion, or a particular form of government. People generally take on a paradigm and ideology and run with it. Um, this next quote here is uh, it's really, it's, uh, from Buckminster Fuller. He says, time, Relativity and consciousness are always coexistent functions of an a priori universe, which is inherently plural. Ergo, all monological explanations are inherently inadequate and axiomatically fallacious. So I really like the way they put this, especially the axiomatically, is because in in applying uh, axioms, uh, the uh, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, this is something that I left out due to time constraints, but Matt had told me that there are fewer time constraints. Um, so I hadn't really worked them into a slide or anything, but they, they, they lead into the next part. There's a quote from, uh, from Carl Jung. He says, Humanity, as never before, is split into two apparently irreconcilable halves. Psychological rule says that when an inner situation is not made conscious, it happens outside as fate. That is to say, when the individual remains divided and does not become conscious of his inner opposite, the world must perforce act out the conflict and be torn into opposing halves. This is it's not even in the same book, but it fits. It's also from Calvin. He says, if things go wrong in the world, this is, because, this is because something is wrong with the individual, because something is wrong with me. Therefore, if I am sensible, I shall put myself right first. For this I need, because no outside authority exists, or because no outside authority no longer means anything to me. A knowledge of the innermost foundations of my being, in order that my, I, might, I may base myself firmly on the eternal facts of the human psyche. So, Jung here in the first, the first part there mentions that we're apparently split into two halves. But at the same time, it's our task to reconcile. Now, this, this, this next quote, it, it might seem a little bit negative, but it, it's coming from the coming from the perspective, or, or it's commenting on the perspective of people who do not do the reconciliation. Um, oh, well, looks like I'm going to read it. Um, <laughs> this is from Jordan Peterson. He's a professor of psychology at University of Toronto, and I, I really like his work. And I really like this quote. <coughs> Nobody knows what is finally true, by definition, but honest people make the best possible use of their experience. 
the moral theories of honest people, however incomplete from some hypothetical transcendental perspective, account for what they have seen and for who they are, insofar as that has been determined in the course of diligent effort. It is not necessary to define truth, to have seen and heard everything. That would make truth itself something impossible. It is only necessary to have represented and adapted to those phenomena characterizing the natural and social worlds as encountered, and the self as manifested. The lie, which is not addressing the self, the lie is willful adherence to a previously functional schema of action and interpretation, a moral paradigm, in spite of new experience, which cannot be comprehended in terms of that schema, in spite of new desire, which cannot find fulfillment within that previous framework. The lie is willful rejection of information apprehended, apprehended as anomalous on terms defined and valued by the individual doing the rejection. That is to say, the liar chooses his own game, sets his own rules, and then cheats. This cheating is fail failure to grow, to mature. It is the rejection of the process of consciousness itself. Now, I don't, I don't think Jordan Peterson, I don't think this fella here, I don't, I don't think he's familiar with the trivium. But when he says things like, in spite of new experience, which means introduction of new grammar, when he says, um, comprehended in terms of that schema, he means um, the logic doesn't work for this new grammar. And then when he says, um, the lie is willful rejection, that, that rejection is, is in a social context, which means the communication aspect of trivium as in rhetoric. What, what he says here when uh, this cheating is failure to grow, rejection of the process of consciousness itself, he is saying that, to me, uh, that this is rejection of the trivium and this, and this systematic methodological process that, to me, um, so far, authentically describes the process of mind. Okay, so why do these extremes persist? Oh, this one works. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know why, how I formatted these sort of things. But some of them, some of them fit. Some of them don't. Okay. So here I'm just going to go briefly uh, into uh, Julian Jane, James. Uh, he had, he had a, a theory. He's a psychologist and a philosopher. Um, he had a, a book called uh, "Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind," and this is a summary from Wikipedia. So. Bicameralism. Human brain wants to assume the state in which cognitive functions were divided between one part of the brain which appears to be speaking and a second part which listens and obeys. So we had their left brain, the sorry, the left brain, the analytical side, which is doing all the thinking stuff, and then there's the listening side, which is the creative, intuitive, right hand side of the brain, which is doing the listening. Um, he thinks that this was the case uh, 3,000 years ago. This is his theory. Um, also from Wikipedia, these two definitions. So the hippocampus is a part of the brain that is at the, basically at the root of the brain, and it, to my mind and in my research, facilitates the communication between both spheres of the brain. Uh, but here it says, it belongs to the limbic system and plays important roles in consolidation of information, short-term memory to long-term memory, and spatial navigation. So, so here we have um, the limbic, the, or sorry, the hippocampus playing an essential role in the internal experience by memory and the external experience by spatial navigation. And now James goes on to describe consciousness more so as um, uh, a consciousness is an aspect dependent on linguistic cognition. So awareness of awareness, but within the aspect, within the conditions of the linguistic dialogue. Now, this is still pretty obtuse, but I'll uh, get around to it. Okay, I think what Julian James is really trying to get at by his discussion of the hippocampus was to describe the inner chatter, the, the dialogue that people have with themselves. Um, now, his, his idea was that pre-breakdown of the bicameral mind, when the bicameral mind was still functioning, there was a free flow of communication between both hemispheres, and that the human chatter was credited to God, spirit, ancestors, the chieftain, or, or whoever, because it seemed to be uh, an, an external sort of uh, sort of experience. It's my take on James's theory and the analysis of the hippocampus that um, through this theoretical paradigm, it could be 
Yeah, it could be that the, uh, the uh, it could be that the hippocampus has provided us more of an uh, experience of self and environment rather than integration between both because of the the structure of memory and the chatter seeming to come from self instead of external. So what you, what might have been chatter between me and the gods beforehand is now between me and me. So, who am I? It's a question I ask myself all the time. It's uh, something that, uh, that affords infinite, uh, infinite rumination. In, in figuring out all the chatter, I, I ask myself this sort of question. And the intention at hand is to be nobody but yourself in a world which is doing its best night and day to make you like everybody else. It means to fight the hardest battle which any human being can fight and never stop fighting. And that, that resonates with me uh, very much. So in my, in my general day-to-day -day life experience, coming back to the functional dualities expressed earlier, I, I ask myself, like, am I experience, or am I expressing myself from a perspective of self, or am I expressing myself from a function of ego? So, I mean, everybody has a, a general idea of, of what these what these terms mean, uh, but it, it hasn't generally it hasn't been generally you know, defined and accepted until until people really agree and. Albert Camus being one of my favorite authors early on in life, reading about existential philosophy, I just came across this quote the other day. I have never read it before, but it's, it's perfect. The only way to deal with an unfree world is to become so absolutely free that your existence is an act. Yes. Love that. So, <laughs> my act of rebellion, I define my terms. That's how I get to this idea of self and who I might be. In asking the previous questions about who am I, I wondered what organ of the body is associated with ego. As all sensation has a home in the body, like can people say, like when you're when you're doing logical stuff, you're you're up in your head, you're thinking, or you're doing linguistic stuff, or you're doing feeling stuff, or you're doing like tasty stuff, or like walking <laughs> stuff, I don't know, or like musical stuff, maybe play guitar, who knows? There there are all these different aspects of the body that are associated with our direct sensational perception of reality. Uh, I think I have some good here. Okay, well, ego itself is a boundary condition, first and foremost. It is the layer between self and other. It is the process by which they interact. Okay, I'm really about it. Um, it's a way of relating between selves. As, as a part of the direct sense perception and not the actual content of self, I figured well, what, what body, or sorry, what organ in the body might it be? And seeing as how ego is really like the first and foremost experience that most people have and may not even get beyond, what's the biggest organ in the body? Anybody? Yeah. Thank you. The dermis, yes. Um, the skin, but it's also the, the first and foremost boundary condition. It is you know, the, the layer that, that, that brushes off that, that, that really is the the last, or the, the front lines between self and otherness. Um, okay, I got a note here that I just wanted to relate a story about the organs of the body being associated with different sense perceptions. So, uh, my friend Paula, I met her here the, the first time that I did a presentation like this. We had met just before I did the presentation and hung out afterwards. And we, we went back to my place uh, afterwards, smoked the dude, and hanging out and having some, having some conversations. And, and she, she's very perceptive. She, she reads people very well. And one thing that she saw in me a lot um, that time and, and in other conversations that we had was that we would, we would be speaking and when, when there was something troubling emotionally to me, I would do this as an action. And, and what, what, I, what, what we pieced out through that was, I was, I was basically blocking my third eye. I was, I was not letting the energy pass. And, like, and, and I'm not somebody who has very good connection to the sensations of body and stuff. That's why I'm working on it here. These sort of events and discussions. But do, doing this sort of thing, it, it really pointed out to me, like, 
like, wow, like that's that's really interesting. And then she pointed out to me another time that I was like just on on like a brain fart sort of a new idea that I'd never really entertained before. But I was doing this, and that's rather than blocking like this, is stimulating like this. And even just just having somebody else point out like accountability, the way you put it down. Uh, just basically, you know, coordinating your efforts with uh, you know, different forms of perception to, to be able to influence the, the experience that we're having right now. It has, it has helped me um, infinitely. So, I define, I define my own terms. Oh, as I mentioned here, I act as the authority of my own existence. And therefore, define my own terms based on my direct experience of reality. And then, then I meant to tell the story about how others also very deeply affect my experience of reality. Um, yet, I came to this definition of ego as simply a tool by which self interacts with other. Can you ask that one? Uh, okay, so we've established the boundary condition for self to interact with other, and that's called ego. Um, if the skin is the organ that manifests ego, then the self is governed by heart. Now, that's not like accurate logic. That's my logic, and it works for me too. <laughs> and Buckminster Fuller, I think, expresses it very well in his definition of the term called synergy. Now, synergy, since he has since he coined the term has become uh, very, or not, not even very, but it, it has become uh, a word in, in common vernacular. People know it, or people have an idea of what synergy means, but generally don't look to the definition, which it is here, it is one time. Like love, synergy is one of those general principles defined scientifically as behavior of whole systems, un unpredictable by behaviors of any other separate parts. What this really gets at to me is that Skin and heart are part of the same whole system, yet they have very different functions in and of themselves. The, the self and the ego are, are not doing the same thing, but they are part of they are, they are part of the overall experience called life. And the next one down here just says, "Love the ego, harmonize with it." Talking about harmonic inclusivity and exclusivity earlier. Um, my, my idea, my take on it is that pretty much while well, every living thing can be harmonized because it follows the same sort of patterns, and why could not all of the parts functioning within an already like, holistic system, why couldn't we harmonize those? Self and ego together, harmonizing. Okay, I, I really wish this one showed up because it's Buckminster Fuller's definition of love, and it's, it's so awesome. Um, love, as per Buckminster Fuller's terms, is omni-inclusive, progressively exquisite, as understanding and tender, and compassionately attuned to other than self. And, and by other than self, I also mean ego. Oh, did I go? Oh, yeah, okay, I did. Okay. He goes, he goes for truth. This is my call to everybody. What, what I find is the task for my experience of life is to hone the ego as a tool for consciousness development. Just as um, knife is to cutting, truth is to human being. Here, here. So we, we have the, the capacity and the ability and the task and oh, I do, I have the task mm -hmm. to, to hone my consciousness, to sharpen it so that it is a precise tool that operates in the world that meets very little resistance. It has the capacity to, you know, just cut it through. Oh shit, I don't forget how I was thinking about that. Yeah, ego, ego is to everyday waking life as self is to peak experience. A rose by any, any other name. So, yeah, by that I mean, I don't even know what I mean. I'm, try, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, bring, I'm trying to bring, bring together these seemingly divergent concepts that really are all talking about the same thing, which is already, which is having harmonized 
the seemingly apparent dualities like self and ego. But these things are called prana, like in yoga, or uh, chi in Taoism, uh, uh, or organotic functionalism in Wilhelm Reich's um, theory, the theory of the science of organ. Um, we have the here and now. We have the moment. We have peak experience. We have nirvana. We have ilan vital, or life force. Uh, vitalism, all these other things. And there's, there's this quote, this, this is totally paraphrased, but it's in the Gospel of Thomas in the New Testament, and uh, Jesus says, if you have this in you, this being the prana, chi, organic functionalism, the here and now, um, well, then you will have eternal life. If not, you, you will surely die. And that's basically the golden rule but it's derived from the, the trivium, which is the, the sense of um, consistently uh, reintegrating the divergent aspects of human experience that present themselves to be experienced. And finally, I'd like to express my gratitude and thanking everybody for allowing me to share this uh, developmental exploration of myself over the past few months, and hopefully I was a little more articulate or eloquent or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for being yourselves. Yeah, it inspired me to be myself better, and that's all that I could ask for. Thank you. Thank you.